AZ Triple C presents the Cancer Care Podcast. From Arizona Center for Cancer Care, joining us today is radiation oncologist Dr. Justin Famoso and Dr. Luis F. Vasquez, otolaryngologist from Elite ENT. You guys already know each other? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, met. We know each other. Yeah. So, so how does a radiation oncologist and an ENT work together? So we work together a lot of times. So anytime there's any sort of cancer of the head and neck, a lot of times it takes just radiation or radiation, chemo, and surgery or any combination of the three. And some tumors, for instance, of like the larynx, are much better treated with radiation than surgery ever will be. So it just depends on what it is. So, Dr. Vasquez, you mentioned tumor in the larynx. Mm -hmm. Mention the different types of cancers for head and neck that could possibly be taken care of by Dr. Famoso. Every single one of them, like literally. Start throwing out different types. Yeah, so, I mean, you can have cancer of the base of tongue. You can have cancer of the epiglottis. You have cancer of the true or false cords. You have cancer of the nasopharynx, which is the part of the back of your nose. You have cancer of the tonsils, cancer of the neck proper. So literally any of those sites are going to be treated solely with radiation or a combination of surgery, radiation, and chemo. So Dr. Famoso, you know me because we've done a podcast before, right. and you know that I'm a curious guy full of rookie questions because Let's go. I am the non-medical guy. So you mentioned cancer on the back of the tongue. Mm-hmm. That's verbiage that I can understand. Mm -hmm. Dr. Famoso, how do you treat that as a radiation oncologist? Yeah. So like Dr. Vasquez was saying, there's a lot of different treatment types that you can employ for cancer of the base of tongue. Really, it comes down to what's the best option for the patient, surgery, radiation, combination of chemo or radiation. And a lot of it plays into size and type of cancer. I've treated a lot of different zebra type cancers, which are the rare stuff, unicorn stuff, where you're just doing chemotherapy and radiation alone. I've seen little tiny run of the mill cancers that are very well lateralized that can be cut out with just a surgery and you're done. Cancer of the head and neck is very unique in the sense that there are many different locations for the cancer to arise from. And each location has subsets in and of itself that dictate the treatment options therein. So is there a type of head and neck cancer that radiation does not treat? Radiation is usually employed in some sense for the large cancers, pretty much anywhere within the head and neck region. If you talk about oral cancers, so oral tongue, lip, those types of cancers, buccal mucosa, which is the lining of your gums, a lot of those cancers are usually treated with surgery first. And then radiation will follow up if there's risky features of that cancer, like size or invasion or something like that. So radiation then is kind of more of the cleanup option rather than the primary treatment. Does the typical chronology go from Dr. Vasquez finding the cancer to one of our medical oncologists and then to you, Dr. Famoso? Is that kind of the... So usually the way it works is a patient will go to their primary care doctor The primary care doctor sees something they don't like in the tongue or the lip, or they did a CAT scan to look at something and something showed up on the CAT scan. If it's in the area of the head and neck, they send them to an ENT like me. And then if it's something that I can biopsy in the office, I biopsy in the office, see them in a a week, and then go over the results with the patient. If it's something that's too far in that I can't biopsy in the office, such as something in the back of the nose, for instance, I schedule them for surgery for a biopsy, maybe even excise it at the same time, or try to excise most of it at the same time. And then based on the results of the pathology, then that's, that's where they go. They almost always will go to radiation. They may go to chemotherapy. So pretty much every tumor of the head and neck, especially if it's a higher grade, will get radiation. And then the chemotherapy is plus or minus. So in the lip, what's that from? Smoking or chewing? Something like that? So lip, the most common cause is actually sun, sun exposure. And, you know, usually... See, I don't even think of that. Yeah. And usually it's basal cell. So the main treatment for that is excision. So you just try to excise it. In the surgery, you do frozen sections on it. So the pathologist will take a look under a microscope and see if you have all the margins. And assuming you have all the margins, you're typically done. So unless you have a lymph node in the neck from spread, and that point it becomes a much higher stage, you just excise a tumor. And then as long as your margins are clear, you're done. But if you have spread to your lymph nodes or somewhere else, then at that point, usually you have to do more like a neck dissection followed by radiation and or chemo. 
Dr. Formoso, how do you protect the patient when they're getting radiation in such sensitive areas? We actually use a really interesting technique. Every radiation treatment is image guided. And I mean that in the true sense that we obtain an image to plan the radiation off of. So it's usually just a CT scan. Listeners will probably understand passing through the donut. So we get a simple Mm -hmm. CT scan passed through the donut where we make a plastic mask of the patient's face. Now the mask is see-through, you can breathe through it, but it keeps the head still. So combined with the mask and the image guidance, we can see where we're targeting these x-rays and we can hit with a very, very high precision, less than half a millimeter so the precision. mask is part of that targeting? The mask is part See, of the precision. I thought that the mask was just protective. Right. So actually what we, what we use to protect these critical structures, kind of like you'd asked about, the critical structures are avoided with the image guidance. So we can actually see where these x-rays are aimed. We can determine where the critical structures would be. So things like salivary glands or the tongue, or if we're talking about the throat, the esophagus, these types of structures, we can actually avoid them with our x-ray beams by using a three-dimensional reconstruction of the patient's body and then avoiding those structures. Do you see that during the process? Yeah, that's my job is to avoid those things. I mean, not just ahead of time targeting, but... During the actual radiation procedure, you see that. Right. So during the radiation procedure, we actually get another low dose CT scan of the head and neck region. And then we overlay that CT scan with the original CT scan that we got. As long as those two CT scans line up one on top of the other, then we know we're in the exact same place every single day. And with that precision, we can be less than half a millimeter away from a cancer and a salivary gland treat the cancer, miss the salivary gland. What does it look like? Like asteroids? Remember um, that game, Asteroids? It kind of, Is that honestly, what it looks like? You know the heat map of Phoenix in the middle of the summer where yeah. it's like red in Phoenix? And oh, you get colors and stuff? Oh, yeah, we got great colors. It's fantastic. So the, the Phoenix is mm-hmm. red and then Flagstaff is blue. Well, you know, like the tumor will be red, covered by a lot of radiation, and then the salivary gland is blue, so minimal radiation. And you can see the radiation hitting. Yeah, well, the computer oh, shows us. Boy, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's just amazing. Nobody can see the x-rays, but the right. computer no, tells understand. us where it's going. And Dr. Vasquez, with the surface type cancers, like on the lip or the tongue, is that a visual inspection? I mean, you can see it, right? Yeah. Usually the primary care doctor will see something they don't like or they don't know. And, you know, most of the time, to be honest with you, it's a normal variant. So an example would be if somebody has something called a torus or a tori, it's a bony outgrowth that you get sometimes in your heart palate or under in your mandible. And that's a normal variant. But, you know, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a little papilloma or sometimes it's a little something that shouldn't be there, a little wart. Sometimes it's a tumor, an actual cancerous tumor. Is it like a discoloration if you go to a dermatologist for your skin? The Most of the time it either looks like an ulcer, which is a breakdown of tissue, right? Or it looks like a little outpouching of tissue, which has a different texture. So instead of being smooth or, or lumpy bumpy like the tongue is at the top, it looks more wart-like or like has a lot of blood vessels on it, which we call like a vascular tumor. And that's what it is. You know? So most of the time, you're, we're dealing with benign disease. It's not something that's cancerous. But sometimes it's, it's cancerous, and we have to deal with it too. And Dr. Vasquez, you don't always know from the primary. In other words, somebody comes in with another type of complication that would be handled by an ENT, and you discover the cancer. Yeah, sometimes you can have a second primary, meaning you have two concurrent tumors that are unrelated to each other. It's weird, though, because usually when you look at a tumor, at least for ENT, you get a spider sense. Like, you know when it's something bad and when it's something that's like a benign or an annoying thing. Just from experience? Just from experience. And to be honest, some of the tumors have a very distinct smell, and you can actually smell it. Like, the second you walk into the room, you can actually smell it. You're like, oh, that's cancer. It's funny because when I have How, medical like students... on the lip or the tongue or breath? Usually or oral cavity. So when you have a tumor of the oral cavity, like you walk in the room and you know it's, it's cancer. You can smell it. That, you, that's pretty disgusting. So it, you know. it is, <laughs> is, is kind of gross. And I try to, when I have students, I try to teach them, like, you know, do you smell that? You teach them, you can pick it up. And it's pretty weird, but it's true. You can also do that with some bacterial infections too. So if they have something called pseudomonas, you can pick that up really quick when you walk in. And fungal infection, you can pick that up by smell also. Just when you walk in the room, you can smell it. And Dr. Formoso, how pinpoint accurate can you be with a smaller type tumor in some of those areas? 
we can be pinpoint accurate to a high degree of certainty. What's interesting is I can actually confirm what Dr. Vasquez was saying about the smell. And Mm -hmm. if you smelled it one time, you would know what we were Mm -hmm. talking about. The interesting thing is that as a radiation oncologist, my role is more of the treatment of the cancer and Dr. Vasquez's role is the identification of it. So he's Mm -hmm. truly the diagnostic expert. So when we talk about we can smell this and understand that it's a cancer or an infection, that's coming from an expert who spent over 10,000 hours it takes to become that type of expert. So as a team, we're like Magic and Kareem. Each of us has our own role that we play. He has to diagnose it and understand when it is cancer or when it's something that's not. You have to hit the shot. Then that's right. It's my time to come in. He sets me up and then I come in with the dunk or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So as the team goes, he identifies it and then I'll treat it. So... So, rookie question again. Typically, the smaller the cancer, the less radiation? Sometimes. So, honestly, we dose radiation based on how many cancer cells are in that tumor. And you can think of each radiation treatment cuts the number of cancer cells by about a third to a half. So, it's not really size, it's density. It's actually just a predetermined dose of radiation. So, there's actually a certain number of treatments, regardless of the size, which doesn't really make intuitive sense, but it makes mathematical sense when you think of the fact that each radiation treatment cuts the tumor cells by about a third to a half. So, if you do that over time, you're going to go from 20 billion cells to then 10 billion cells. Well, the first radiation treatment really didn't do much of anything. It's those last five radiation treatments where you're going from eight to four to two to one, and then hopefully to zero. But that whole process generally takes the same number of treatments, no matter how big the tumor is. Cosmetically, just because I know people are curious, does it have any of the same complications, hair loss? The complications and side effects of radiation really are determined where we aim these x-rays. We're not treating anywhere near the esophagus, then the patient's not going to have problems swallowing. But that being said, if we're aiming those x-rays towards the esophagus, then that's certainly an issue. Radiation causes inflammation. So if you think of side effects of radiation being similar to a sunburn, where we aim those x-rays is where the sunburn is going to happen. So with head and neck treatment, sometimes we're talking about a sunburn on the bottom of your tongue or a sunburn in the back of your throat. It's not exactly the most fun procedure to have, but on the back end, we are dealing with good probabilities of control and cure. So it's kind of like you got to put in the pain now to see the gain later. And really what we're having is during the course of radiation, side effects don't really pop up until midway through. So half the time you're getting radiation is like a honeymoon phase where you feel nothing at all. It's very much like getting a chest x-ray. People set you up, they turn on the machine and they get you out of the room and Mm -hmm. you don't feel like anything's happened. But then the back end of radiation is when these inflammatory changes start. Where we aim that beam, if it's towards the skin, the skin could get red. If it's towards the throat, the throat could get red. And you talk about hair loss, we're not usually causing hair loss in the sense that you're going bald because with head and neck radiation, x-rays are usually aimed towards the neck. I get it. Yeah. So Dr. Vasquez, so you send a patient to Dr. Famoso, that patient does have some swelling in sensitive areas. Do you send them back to Dr. Vasquez? Yeah, honestly, I can't tell you how many times a patient shows up and they say, Doc, what's this? And I say, oh. So you guys do know each other well. (laughs) Yeah, 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 for sure. And like you were saying, not everybody will necessarily need radiation, but if it's a small tumor, I cut it out, done, end of story. You do that. Yeah, but if you cut it out and it turns out that, hey, this was a pretty malignant variant of this tumor, we should radiate it to make sure we didn't leave a couple cells behind and make sure that it doesn't come back. The recurrence of it is a huge thing you prevent with, with radiation. And then, like I was saying, and then in the higher grades, you have to do the radiation along with the excision because if you don't, you're not really going to control it in the first place. And people have any sort of side effects like dry mouth or difficulty swallowing. Any way you look at it, you're better with a radiation than you would have just been with surgery alone because if you do just surgery alone you end up taking more tissue. And once the tissue is gone, it's gone. But if you radiate it, there's a chance that you spare, you save some of those healthy tissues when you're finished with the treatment. Being that careful, does the pathologist really come into play a number of times? So you do the excision, goes to the pathologist with a biopsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, we can't read slides. Right. So when I sent out a specimen to pathology, we place our trust completely in the pathologist to tell us what grade it's going to be. So if it's a low grade or a high grade, and that's going to determine the amount of treatments of radiation that they need. Okay, so then it goes to Dr. Famoso, and Dr. Famoso, after you do the radiation, 
It goes back again to the pathologist, right, to make sure it's clear? Not always, but it will go back to Dr. Vasquez because mm. if a tumor comes back, Dr. Vasquez is going to be the one to identify it. So as a radiation oncologist, I step in, I treat the cancer, but then just because we're done with radiation doesn't mean you're done seeing a doctor. Now you actually have to have more doctor visits and actually in a shorter period of time to have somebody look down your throat and make sure the cancer's gone and that it stays gone. And that's Dr. Vasquez. We talk about cancer kind of being this circular path of diagnosis, treatment, and then surveillance, Monitoring. which is follow up to make sure that if something else comes up, you're diagnosed appropriately in a short amount of time. And that's Dr. Vasquez. So it's a big circle. So, and I really ask the question, if you guys know each other all day long, you guys are going, Alexa, Dr. Famoso, <laughs> Alexa, Dr. Vasquez. <laughs> no. So for, for example, let's like say somebody has a tonsil cancer and let's say that we excised it and did some radiation for it. After we finish the treatment, the patient's going to get a follow-up CAT scan in given intervals of time and also having visits with me and him. So you have two eyes looking at you, me with a camera looking down the back of your throat behind the tongue to look back there as well as through the mouth. And you also having CT to see things I can't see under the tissues. So that's how you monitor somebody. So you're doing follow-up CTs and you're also doing visual examinations. Is they, the patient awake all the time when you're doing that? For the CTs and the scoping, yeah. Yeah, because the scope that we do in ENT is different than a scope that a pulmonologist does in your lungs or a GI doctor does with an EGD. The scope that we do in ENT is a flexible, small scope, so the size of a spaghetti noodle, and we put it down the back of your nose and get behind the palate and go down to the larynx. And it's the patient feels usually easier than a COVID test. So if you've seen a COVID okay. test, they're doing that swab all the way to the back of the nose. That swab is roughly the same size as the scope, but when we do a scope in the office, we decongest the nose first with a nasal decongestant, and we'll, we're looking directly through the scope so we can avoid structures that can cause pain. So it's actually easier than a COVID test. You heard my producer kind of laugh out there because after <laughs> he had his first COVID test, he said, I'd rather get my prostate checked again. <laughs> <laughs> and went, oh, okay. And that's based on how, how deviated your septum is, how congested your nose is, and technique. And all those three, ENT is going to be the best at all three of those. What's the toughest type of cancer, head and neck, for you guys to treat? Anaplastic. Explain okay. that to me. There's a tumor that's really rare of the thyroid that doesn't respond to anything. So you can hit radiation at it, chemotherapy at it, you can do surgery at it. Nothing really works. Even if you do the surgery on it, it only needs like one cell to just keep growing. And it comes back. Luckily, it's incredibly rare. But it's something that literally the patient has a year or less to survive when you get the diagnosis of it. And typically they die in months after the diagnosis. I mean, if you have to make a comparison, we've talked, Dr. Famoso, before about how tough pancreatic can be. Would that be comparative? You're just doing your best to yeah, get as much time as possible. That's what you're talking about, hospice. Yeah. You put a trach on the patient and then you do hospice because this specific tumor is a tumor of the thyroid. So eventually it'll block off your airway and you die of asphyxiation before you die of anything else. So that's not a way to go. Yeah. So what we do is we put a trach below where the tumor would be so that they keep you comfortable and that way you don't die of breathing difficulties. And Dr. Formosa, when we talk about the thyroid, it's so sensitive anyway in terms of people trying to gate it and medications and people just struggle with that anyway. Radiation, that's a pretty sensitive area. Yeah, well, we certainly try to protect the thyroid when patients go in for routine screening exams because it's a sensitive location. It's prone to carcinogenic mutations. So we try to block it when patients have x-rays or CT scans. But on the flip side, it's actually very sensitive to radiation in some other senses that many types of thyroid cancers, when you cut them out, a lot of times that's all you need. But if you have a little left over after surgery, then actually a radioactive pill is the treatment. So it's very, very sensitive to radiation nine times out of 10. But like we were talking about anaplastic thyroid cancer, it's still one of those quirky tumors that we still have to do research on to figure out the best way to treat it. We don't know it just yet, but we're certainly conducting a lot of clinical trials, just like in pancreas and a lot of brain tumors. We're, mm -hmm. we're working on it. So, Dr. Vasquez, I know that patients come to you for a number of different reasons. Do a lot of them come to you once they're getting symptoms of the ears, nose, and throat? And by that time, it could be a little bit more advanced, more difficult? It depends what tumor you're 
asking about. Most of the time when somebody sees me, it's a non-cancerous issue. So they have a feeling like there's something stuck in their throat and it's just reflux or it's allergy that's causing drainage and causing some issues. So I put them on reflux medication, do an allergy test on them, put them on allergy medications, do stuff like that. Or if somebody comes in with nasal obstruction, it's not going to be nasopharyngeal tumor. It's going to be septal deviation. I fix their septum and everybody's happy. Or it's sinus disease. That you I get do a sinus lot of that, the septum that. deviations. I all hear, the time. I hear about that it's super all common. the time. Oh, yeah. It's super common to have a deviated septum. And that narrows your breathing. And it's not a tumor in there. It's not a polyp. You just have a busted over nose. You fix it. It's easy surgery. 45 minutes, you're done. Ear pressure. You know, a lot of times, oh, it's a tumor. No, it's you just have eustachian tube dysfunction. So you have allergies and... That swells on you, and you put a little tube in there. If the medications don't help, and there we go, equalizes your ear. People that have radiation, a lot of times will have swelling of the nose, a swelling of the east tissue tube. You got to put the tube in there so that it equalizes the pressure in the ears. A lot of commercial pilots come in for ear tube placement because they're going up and down, up and down all the time, and that escalation, de-escalation causes pressure in the ear, which everybody's felt when you elevate. You put a tube in, problems go away. So, you know, a lot of the times it's more of a simple thing. So we do a lot of that as as ENTs. So it really is a two-way referral between you guys. What have we missed? We've covered a lot. What have we missed? Actually, one more thing that's very common in people that have high-grade tumors is when they have the radiation, they often need chemo. And something that's very, very common is to actually have some hearing loss from the chemo because we use these platinum compounds for that. And luckily, when they come see me, we can hook them up with some hearing aids because it's a very common side effect of having some of the platinum compounds uh, for chemo. As far as a patient, we always mention that the earlier you get diagnosed, Mm -hmm. the better. That can't be a fun conversation to have with anybody. But is that pretty much true with head and neck? The earlier you can diagnose them, the better chance you're giving Dr. Famoso and, yeah, and the, the medical thing, oncologist. And the big and, thing is chronicity. So if it's go- going on, same symptoms, on and off, for longer than a month, definitely longer than two months, come see me. And then I'll tell you if it's just reflux or it's just a vocal cord hemorrhage or, or something in the case of hoarseness. So that most of the time, it's, it's going to be benign. It's not going to be something bad. But come in, let me take a look, see what it is. I'll give you an answer regardless, whether it's a good answer or a bad answer. A visit with an ENT, and most ENTs see patients even uh, cash pay. It'll cost you about $200 to go see an ENT and have have them scope you really quick. They take a look at the base of your tongue. They take a look at the back of your nose and your vocal cords, and then they'll feel your neck. And if they see any sort of, feel any sort of masses or see anything that's weird, then, you know, maybe they can catch something that's a good thing you came. And if there's nothing, then, hey, you can sleep well at night because they didn't see anything. Dr. Formoso, I think last time we talked about people self-diagnosing themselves being Google doctors, Google experts. Yeah. Oof. In the case of Dr. Vasquez, especially with ears, nose, and throat, they must be looking at every video oh, they yeah. shouldn't be looking at That's right. before oh, yeah. they even come and see you. Oh, yeah. I, I swear, Dr. Vasquez, I have a worm in my ear. I mean, you oh, must yeah. get it all. I, I get I got parasites in my nose. I got parasites <laughs> in my ears. I got foreign bodies everywhere. I get all all sorts of stuff, especially now with with COVID. Everyone's like hypersensitive to their nose, you know, because they know you can lose your sense of smell, which is true. You can lose your sense of smell. It's certainly not the only virus that can do that. Many viruses can make you lose your smell permanently or or temporarily, but it just got a lot of claim to fame now, COVID and the smell slash taste changes. But we got a lot of self-diagnosis, especially the reflux too. People feel like there's something stuck in the throat. They have a tumor in their throat. And it's just what we call globus. And globus is a feeling like there's something stuck in your throat. And that's very common with acid reflux. Dr. Famoso, Justin Famoso, radiation oncologist. You're so well known already to the AZCCC audience and to the entire family in the circle. But ArizonaCCC.com is the best way to get hold of Dr. Justin Famoso and Dr. Vasquez, the best way to get hold of you? Our website is actually uh, www.eliteentaz.com. I mean, we're over at Cave Creek and the 101. Awesome. <laughs> Did we cover everything, guys? Dr. Famoso, I'm working on that medical degree. Hey, I'm working on it. You got another what? You got another 9,999 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you guys that Dr. Famoso and I have become friends. And before we started this podcast, Dr. Famoso, you're a big sports fan. And I said, hey, you could do a sports podcast. But I did tell Dr. Famoso, I can teach you to do what I do, which is broadcasting. 
but I promise you can never teach Doogie Hauser here to be a radiation oncologist. Oh, I promise you. <laughs> nah, we can see what we can do. You know, Dr. young Just, dogs, new tricks. Uh, you know, th- it'd be an old dog learning new tricks. I guarantee <laughs> no, you, doctor. I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> Justin from also my best to your family as well. Uh, thank you. you too, and Dave. Dr. Luis Vasquez. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. And please join us again for the Cancer Care Podcast presented by Arizona Center for Cancer Care. For more information on the highest quality of cancer treatment in Arizona, please go to ArizonaCCC.com.